On an island just below the first cataract of the Nile, an ancient inscription written around the 4th century B.C. was found which claimed to be a copy of a document written by Pharaoh Djoser more than 1,000 years earlier. It is the story of a land grant made by the Pharaoh to the priests of the god Num. It tells of seven years of famine and seven years of plenty, how Pharaoh had a dream and consulted his chancellor for help. It contains most elements of the seven years of famine and seven years of plenty story, although they were corrupted in this account, written over one thousand years after the event took place. But most importantly, the priests who wrote this inscription were relying upon the land grants made by this pharaoh to justify their claim to some land. They were not writing what they believed was an ancient myth. They obviously believed the land grants made by Pharaoh Djoser to still be valid and of enough authority to still be in effect well over 1,000 years later. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh. Ancient Egyptian records list Djoser as the sixteenth Pharaoh of Egypt, and historians have classified him with the so-called Third Dynasty. His chancellor, named Imhotep, was first known through the writings of the Egyptian historian Manetho, who in the third century B.C. wrote, During Djoser's reign there lived a man named Imhotep, who had the reputation of the Greek god of medicine, and who invented the art of building with hewn stone. The legends attributed to Imhotep were so incredible that he was considered to be mythical until this century, when excavations at Djoser's pyramid complex revealed the base of a statue with the name Djoser on it and the name Imhotep, with his long list of titles, one of which was Chief Under the King, a title which first appears with Imhotep and also was first bestowed upon Joseph. Imhotep was also the architect of Pharaoh Djoser's pyramid and surrounding complex, a veritable city within a city of incredible beauty and extremely advanced in design. Built on the plateau of Saqqara adjacent to ancient Memphis, the pyramid within the complex is the first ever built in Egypt. Ron Wyatt spent a great deal of time here searching for evidence which might shed light on the biblical account. Such an event is the famine described in the story of Joseph, and the distribution of grain to the other countries would have required a major facility and system of organization. When the famine came and Joseph's brothers came from Canaan to get grain from Egypt, we are told that they went to Joseph, which indicates that he personally oversaw the distribution, at least to those coming from foreign countries and this would mean that there was certainly a central location or granary to which the foreigners came. The complex at Saqqara contains eleven massive pits which even the Egyptians are at a loss to explain. They are not tombs, for all tombs were underground and carefully sealed, while these were accessible from the surface, and they are extremely large. But most fascinating is the fact that they are all connected by chutes. Ron believes these were the grain storage pits of the seven-year famine. As grain was removed from one pit, grain from the other pits flowed through the chutes, making the grain always accessible from one location. These are within the wall of the step pyramid complex, which has only one entrance and it opens to a long covered passageway with small cubicles on each side, each just the right size for a person to sit with perhaps a small table. The narrow, singular entrance would have allowed only a few people to enter at a time. There was no doubt in Ron's mind that this was the main center of grain distribution on a massive scale.
As people arrived to get their grain, they lined up to enter the long corridor. Inside, they paid one of the cashiers in one of the cubicles for the grain. After payment was made, perhaps they were given a sack for grain which reflected the amount of their payment. Then they proceeded through the corridor straight to the area of the grain bins. Once there, they descended the stairway next to the storage bins, handed their sack to a worker who filled it with grain and returned it to them. Then they exited through a small door on the lower level which led to the outside of the complex. When the pits were first excavated, bits of grain still remained in them. During the seven-year famine, Egypt gained great wealth and prominence among the nations through the selling of the grain. The Egyptians who lived in their cities along the Nile had little to do during the famine since they had a seven-year supply of grain to rely on and were able to devote their time to the building projects of the pharaoh, not as slaves, but as grateful subjects. The family of Jacob who lived in the Delta, separate from the native population, prospered and grew, exempt from the one-fifth taxation levied on the native population. From the time Jacob's family came to Egypt until the birth of Moses, many pharaohs had come and gone, many ruling contemporaneously with others in different regions. But until now, all recognized the rights granted to the people of Israel to live in the land of Ramses.
once in a while I get people that really, that, or that claim they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, well, why not? Really, why not? You guys believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, made a hard rocky crust, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. Found somebody to marry, and something to eat of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. There are some lies in our science books. Taught it for 15 years. Even though I'm not teaching it anymore, I still like the study. It's so many neat things to learn. We're going to cover some of that tonight. I'm not against science. I'm not against schools. I'm not against teachers. Because most of them don't know what they believe. You have to tell them. They teach the kids it all started with a big bang 20 billion years ago. What exploded? <laughs> this is what the textbooks teach. Before the big bang, there was nothing, literally nothing, an infinitesimal nugget of space. And then something happened, triggering the most colossal explosion in history. Yes, boys and girls, you see, nothing exploded, and uh, here we are. So I asked Mr. Fesser if I could ask him some questions about the Big Bang. I said, where did all this matter come from? He said, well, we don't know that for sure. I said, well, sir, would you please tell me where the laws came from? The universe is run by laws, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia. Who gave the laws? He said, we don't know that either. I said, sir, could you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make a Big Bang. Who bought the gas to run this machine anyway? Hmm? He said, we don't know that either. I said, uh, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> what else? What do you mean, else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, the fragments will all spin the same direction. The professor said, yes, I understand about the conservation of angular momentum. I said, well, good. I'd like to ask you a question then, sir. If the whole universe began as a swirling dot, like you said, why do two planets spin backwards? He said, that's interesting. <laughs> I said, no, that's more than interesting. It's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. Not only that, six of the moons are spinning backwards. Why? He said, I don't know. Why do you think they're going backwards? Uh, I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe God created the heaven and the earth like the Bible teaches, you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. But you said, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that either. We don't don't tell me either. my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, sir. They're both religious. Evolution is a religion. So you have to believe. So ask the professor, where did the matter come from? He said, I don't know. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. He said, uh, Mr. Hovind, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. He said, you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> Charles Darwin was disciplined. I mean, he did these extraordinary experiments, this series of experiments. Then they're going to tell the kids, well, we have evidence for this theory. Charlie Darwin stopped off at these islands right there called the Galapagos Islands. Charlie studied the birds very carefully and said, you know what, I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> you see 14 kinds of birds and you conclude that birds and bananas are related. Here are these ancient dinosaur bones or fossils. They tell the kids they have evidence of evolution from fossils. I don't think so. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know that it had any kids. And you sure don't know that it had different kids. You bring in a bone to the judge. Judge, I found this bone in the dirt. This is the ancestor of all the humans today. <laughs> they would laugh at you. You don't know that that's the ancestor of anybody. And why on earth would you think a bone in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? They'll say, boys and girls, you have two bones in your wrist, radius and ulna. And boys and girls, look at the whale's flipper carefully. Did you know the whale has two bones in his flipper and they're called the radius and the ulna? Same as ours. Wow, who named them, teacher? The whale? Think about it. I'm here to tell my people it's time to stop believing bull just because a tell you bull with a straight look on their face. Evolution say people came from monkeys. And the question is, why is there still monkeys? Is these the retarded monkeys? They didn't turn into people just yet. 
Even Stephen Gould admitted the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages is a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. See, what's happened, these guys have looked for missing links in the, in the fossil record. They can't find any. And so they say, well, maybe evolution happened so fast it wasn't preserved. Maybe a reptile laid an egg and a bird hatched out. Well, who did that bird marry? Hmm? This process that brought us to be is billions of years old. It happens very fast, billions of years fast. Here is um, radioactivity. We're going to tell the kids in the late 1940s they invented carbon dating. We're going to explain a little bit about radiometric dating and how it's supposed to work and then show you that it does not work, okay? It sounds good, but there are some assumptions that mess everything up. If we had walked into a room and found a candle burning on the table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know, Mr. Hovind, it was burning when I got here. Okay, well then, let's do some empirical science. Let's measure the height of the candle. Suppose the candle is seven inches tall. Who can tell me when it was lit? Okay, nobody. Let's do some more empirical science. Let's measure the rate of burn. Suppose we determine it's burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You're going to have a hard time telling me unless you're willing to make some assumptions. You find a fossil in the dirt. You can measure how much C14 is in it. Very accurately, by the way. And you can measure how fast it's decaying. That's just like measuring the height of your candle and how fast it's burning. Now, when did that animal die? You don't have a clue. Here's what you ought to consider about carbon dating. Samples of known age, it doesn't work. If it's a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. These, it's just really a hard thing. It's, it's really a hard thing. Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. Living penguins, carbon dated 8,000 years old. One part of Dima was 40,000 years old, another part was 26,000, and the wood next to it is 9,000. Then they tell the kids about the geologic column. They say each of the layers is a different age, you know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all them Zoic boys. Now, if you get a petrified tree standing up, running through different rock layers, I don't think it's smart to say those layers are vastly different ages. Those trees did not get slowly covered by the sediments over millions of years. They would rot and fall down. Uh, crazy. I just, uh, say, boys and girls, you have an appendix that you don't need anymore. It's a vestigial structure. That's proof of evolution. Well, excuse me, you do need your appendix. The appendix is part of your immune system. If your appendix is taken out, you can still live, okay, but it increases your susceptibility to quite a few diseases. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes also. That doesn't prove you don't need them. There are no vestigial organs, and even if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. I was taught when I went to school, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? <laughs> Have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? Wouldn't that be nice, man, be able to grab that door and walk right around and get in? <laughs> Lost it because we didn't need it. Man, you could drive the car and tune the radio knob and hold the Coke at the same time. What we're finding is that natural selection seems to be an incredibly important factor in generating new species. Natural selection. The key evolutionary mechanism Darwin identified. The bad designs get eaten by the good ones, and so all you have is good ones. Why is there still monkey? Natural selection doesn't cause any evolution. It makes sure the bad ones don't survive, but it's not going to change it to something else. That's what evolution is. If you worked in a factory that produced cars, and your job was to check for defects, and you caught every single mistake, and you rejected it, how long would it take that process to change the car to an airplane? You say, it'll never change it. <laughs> That's my point. The students are taught we have evidence from development. Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of evidence. This textbook says, the human embryo growing in the mother has gills like a fish. Those little folds of skin are not gills. Those little wrinkles under your chin when you're growing up later develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen folks that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. <laughs> Those are not gill slits. Ernst Haeckel, though, said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book. 
He made huge charts of his posters of his drawings of these embryos and traveled all over Germany and just about by himself converted the Germans to believing in evolution. Haeckel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and he changed them to make them look exactly alike. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings, underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Now either he's a lousy artist or he's a liar. Well, it turns out he's a liar. He was convicted of fraud by his own university, proven to be a fraud. But guess what? Haeckel's fake drawings are still used in textbooks in your state right now. It's only been proven wrong 125 years ago. I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but that ought to be plenty of time. Adolf Hitler said, you let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Watch this sentence here carefully. Some kid's doing this for homework tonight. Boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? Now, what kind of question is that? Doesn't that question assume that evolution has happened? What if a kid doesn't believe in evolution? How is he supposed to do his homework tonight? That question does not teach him how to think critically. That teaches him what to think, not how to think. And when the kid gets done with this course, he's going to think he knows how to think. But he doesn't. He knows how to be told what to think. Brainwashing at taxpayer expense. They want to use my tax dollars to teach that to your kids in our schools. If you want to deny evolution, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it, because we need them. And that's where the problem comes in, okay? If you want to believe in the Big Bang, just enjoy yourself, but keep your religion at home. The Russian atheist astronomer came to America and spoke at one of the universities, and he said, started off his speech, he said, folks, either there is a God or there isn't. Both possibilities are frightening. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're hurtling through space around the sun right now at 66,000 miles an hour, and nobody's in charge. <laughs> That's a scary thought. But if God made the world, he owns it. That means he makes the rules. You see, if there is a God, we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says. Malcolm Muggeridge said, I am convinced the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been taught, applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. It's a joke. And it would be a joke if it weren't for the tragic results. How many kids are taught this thing every day and believe it, and it destroys their faith? Find you something to believe in. Whole thing, who do you even pray to? Nobody. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? You ought to think about it because you will be dead for a long time. Doesn't matter how long you live, you're going to be dead longer than that. You know, George Washington died 200 years ago, and he's still dead. How much longer does he have to go? He's going to be dead for a long time. All you get in this life is a little bitty dash between two dates. Just a little, and it's gone. What are you going to do with your dash? Where would you go if you died? Now, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, you ought to give your heart to the Lord and get saved. Say, Lord, you may have it, the whole thing. If you are saved, you ought to find something to do for the Lord. And you ought to quit worrying about getting a fancier car and a fancier house and start worrying about who's going to heaven or hell. Maybe God gave you that good job so you can give some money to missionaries, not so you can build a bigger, fancier house. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And if you don't want it, well, that's your business. But the devil is laughing at you for believing in that. But God loves you, and he wants you to come to heaven. And if you'd like to find out how to go to heaven, come see me. I'll be glad to show you. The Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing. Literally nothing. Nothing created everything. The Big Bang is an amazingly difficult thing to wrap your brain around, which isn't surprising. 13.7 billion years ago, we think it was tiny. Nothing. Literally nothing was tiny. And then something happened. Nothing created all the matter we see in the universe today. Nothing is more powerful than nothing. And that's what trips most of us up. It was the explosion of nothing. Find you something to believe in. World getting crazy. Hey, you better believe something.